Good afternoon, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The biggest danger was that they took me in, and I was thinking it was a Christian church. And it wasn't a Christian church. It was a cult. Joseph Smith did not get right even one word in this whole translation. The leaders have to go back and rework, rewrite, cover up, change, delete, add, all the way through on uh, all of their books. He can eventually grow into becoming a god himself. Are you saying that the Mormon church pressures individuals into divorcing their spouses when they're not measuring up to the church's standards? And here's a church that teaches family unity, and they destroyed my marriage. In the early 1980s, two revolutionary motion pictures, The Godmakers and The Temple of the Godmakers, were released. For the first time ever on film, the heresies of Mormonism were revealed and the world was exposed to some of the darkest secrets of the Latter-day Saints. These disclosures, showing Mormonism to be distinctly separate from Christianity, caused mayhem within the Mormon Empire. They forced Mormon leadership to modify several so-called unchangeable sacred doctrines to not only counter the message of the films, but to vie again for a place alongside Christianity. While doctrinal changes have been going on since the beginning of the foundation of Mormonism, the changes of the 90s are the most dangerous. We are seeing Mormonism being repackaged with an endearing Christian wrapper. More than ever, the LDS church people are working harder to look more Christian than the Christians. They are spending tens of millions of dollars annually on ad campaigns appealing specifically to the Christian market. Christians must realize that the Mormon hope of appearing Christian is not reflected in their teachings. The recent changes are only cosmetic. Don't be deceived by the pretty new face. For 19 years, I was an active and devout member of what I regarded to be the only true church on earth. I had a burning desire to please God. Much like converts to the Mormon church today, I was attracted by its call to moral decency, its virtuous pro-family values, its politically conservative emphasis, and outspoken enthusiasm for what I believe to be real Christianity. Today, the powerful Mormon church claims a membership of over 8 million people and a determined missionary program steadily converts over 300,000 people annually. Out of the 4.2 million members in the USA, 60 to 80 percent of its converts are said to come from Christian backgrounds. As Mormons strive to be classified as Christians, they obscure their anti-Christian identity and deceive millions worldwide into joining what they promote as another Christian denomination. In just over 160 years, the Mormon Church has become one of the world's most powerful financial institutions. Literally billions of dollars a year are received from its faithful members in the forms of tithes. One conservative guess is that $15 million a day is harvested from Mormons worldwide, with over half that from Mormons in America alone. In addition, the Mormon Church generates more than $6 billion yearly through its many business enterprises and subsidiaries. This income places them among the world's wealthiest corporations. The LDS land holdings in central Florida alone outsize Disney World by 10 to 1. Both business and church assets are shrewdly funneled through several holding companies controlled by a corporate power base known as the General Authorities or the Brethren. Although elevated to the office of spiritual leaders, the majority of these men had been successful businessmen before they were called by revelation to join the LDS hierarchy. Church members, including those in lower levels of leadership who have faithfully and sacrificially contributed their tithes, time, and energy, are powerless to call for an accounting or participate in any corporate decisions. They must faithfully submit to every manipulation from the top. John Heinerman, director of the Anthropological Research Center in Salt Lake City, is an active and devout Mormon who is refreshingly candid about the wealth and power of his church. I have always been fascinated with the great wealth and power 
that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints wields nationally and internationally. With all the research that we have done, the figure is close to 11 and a half to 12 billion dollars worldwide, all of their investments and holdings. These investments and holdings primarily fall into real estate, which comprise close to half of the assets of the church. Another percentage of about 25% uh, would be in business holdings, agribusiness, their ranches. One thing that I was amazed at was that the LDS church rolls over every year between one and a half and two and a half billion dollars just in its investment portfolio on that. They're into everything from uh, uh, agricultural futures like soybeans, uh, pork bellies. Someone I talked with from the finance department some years ago said, when we make investments, we don't pray to God and we don't go by revelation. We do it just like the world does. It has been reported that the Mormon church is the second largest financial institution west of the Mississippi River. A few men at the top of the Mormon empire are uh, tremendously wealthy. They receive uh, uh, income from the institutions that they control. They are among the uh, larger holders of uh, corporate power in our country. Joseph Smith, self-proclaimed prophet of God and founder of the Mormon Church, used the doctrine of divine revelation to legitimize the taking of many wives and spiritualized it as an essential doctrine of his Mormon religion. In addition to his first wife, Emma, Smith appears to have actively enjoyed at least 27 other wives, many of whom were already married. His first plural wife was a barely pubescent teenage relative who was living in their home at the time. Polygamy became a standard requirement of Mormonism necessary for entrance into the highest level of heaven, referred to by Mormons as the celestial kingdom. Brigham Young, successor to Joseph Smith and second prophet of the Mormon church, vigorously proclaimed that the only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Mormon scripture still says that those who abide not in this doctrine shall be damned. In 1890, government pressure forced the Mormon church to reevaluate this divine commandment. The confusion and anger that resulted from this undermining of a non-revocable eternal commandment resulted in the formation of many offshoots of Mormonism. Generally known as fundamentalists, these groups openly practice polygamy today and hold to the teachings of the first two prophets. Changing doctrines is not new to Mormonism and has over the years fragmented Smith's original church into over 100 separate groups that still claim Joseph Smith as the prophet of God and the Book of Mormon as divine scripture. Well, I was born and raised in the Mormon Church, and I can remember, uh, because of my heritage, going to my cousin's family reunion, and we had to wear name tags with um, the wife's name so we, could, so we knew which family we were descended from. We were raised with the basic tenets of Mormonism, including polygamy. That is what was openly and freely practiced uh, in our community. My great-grandfather, John D. Lee, was a polygamist. He served under Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He had 19 wives and 64 children so that he could become a god as God is now. He really believed that God and Jesus are polygamists and that every Mormon man would have to have a lot of wives. My father had a total of 11 wives. We were very sincere about all the aspects of Mormonism. Uh, we used the Book of Mormon as one of our main sources of uh, knowledge. Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the Mormon scriptures, say that you must have plurality of wives. It is a requirement in Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It is clearly stated that uh, if we are to attain the highest degree of glory, that we uh, must do the works of Abraham. Therefore, we were taught that in order to attain the celestial glory, uh, a man must take more than one wife. There's also the warning that any person who will not believe this and enter into polygamous temple marriages, they shall be destroyed. So the pressure was on always for men to um, 
marry several women. It's been estimated there, there's between 25 and 30,000. For your sins on Calvary's cross and that sacrifice is the sufficient payment for your sins. You are instantly and eternally saved by the grace of God. Former Mormon prophet Lorenzo Snow summed up the Mormon doctrine of salvation by stating, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. This is supported in Mormon scripture. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. Yet Jesus himself clearly taught that God is spirit, that he did not have a body of flesh and blood, or flesh and bone. In spite of such clear instruction, Mormon prophet David O. McKay declared that the appearing of the Father in bodily form to Joseph Smith is the foundation of the church. Someone who says, I saw the Father, is dealing presumptuously, short-circuiting, good Christian theology. It is the Son who alone reveals the Father. This is no small matter and is the plumb line of Mormon heresy. Mormons believe that God is a resurrected man and that we can become just like him. A God cannot be made. A God cannot be created. The definition of the eternal God is that he is eternal, immortal, invisible. That's who the God of the universe is, and there is none other. A man is a created being, and as a created being, it will always be the case with him that in God he lives and moves and has his being. He is dependent upon the fountainhead of life, which is God himself. He cannot move by his own volition or anybody else's to the level of godhood, although that is very appealing to certain individuals. There's a question before the house in Christianity in our time that really is, can a man become God? That question is answered in the affirmative by many of the cults, like the Mormons, like the New Age movement. I assure you, it is totally presumptuous. I, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, am somewhat active in what is called the New Age movement. The New Age movement consisting of uh, things like uh, crystal gazing, channeling, pyramid power, and so forth and so on. People of the New Age movement are often more open to the truths of Mormonism, like the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith working with the Urim and Thummim, than conservative Christian folks who are mostly closed-minded to these things. The goal of every Mormon man is to become the duplicate of the Mormon's concept of God, to reign over planets and solar systems, and enjoy everlasting celestial sex with thousands of goddess wives. The Mormon temple plays a vital role in the achievement of such goals, yet 75% of the LDS members are not deemed worthy enough to enter and will never see the inside of a temple. However, when members do meet church temple requirements, then they are allowed to participate in the LDS occult temple ceremonies, which actually bring them under further spiritual bondage. Part of this bondage is the requirement to wear sacred temple underwear 24 hours a day from that day on. Behind me is the Los Angeles Temple of the Mormon Church, and inside are many devout Mormons who are fulfilling what they consider to be godly, noble obligations to their faith and to their God. What they don't realize, though, is that the rituals and the ceremonies that they are involved in are straight out of the occult. How do I know that? Because I was a Mormon who went to the temple. I attended the temple many times, but more importantly, I was also a high priest of Satan. Before I joined the Mormon church, I had 12 years of experience in witchcraft and Satanism. And when I went to the temple, I was astounded at the high level of similarity. The handshakes and the grips involved, the, the secret tokens of the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood are in fact right out of witchcraft and Satanism. The concept of, of putting on as part of your priesthood robes an apron which God rejected in the Garden of Eden. Lucifer himself in the temple says, this apron is a symbol of my power and priesthoods. So when I went through the temple, I was ultimately very satisfied by it because I thought this was, in fact, a profound satanic initiation ceremony. All throughout the temple grounds here in Salt Lake City, you will find all sorts of occult symbols, symbols that are generally associated with witchcraft and Satanism. 
They are predominantly on the temple, but they're also on such buildings as the uh, assembly hall, and you can even find them in the visitor center. I mean, the, the place is virtually a Disneyland of occult symbols, and yet there is absolutely no Christian symbol anywhere in here. These doors behind me are doors in the east end of the Salt Lake Temple, and overarching the doors is a trapezoid keystone with an inverted pentagram, which has been used for centuries as a symbol of devil worship, as a symbol of Satan. In fact, the main function of the pentagram in its inverted form is to call down the kingdom of Satan and the manifestation on earth. The Bible forbids participation in divination, witchcraft, and contacting the dead. Among the Mormon temple rituals is the practice of baptism for the dead. When their dead are called up to convert to Mormonism. During these ceremonies, many Mormons have had exhilarating and even frightening encounters with apparitions or spirit beings inside the temple. Former Mormon prophet Wilfred Woodruff admitted to being surrounded by the dead at one point while inside the temple and warned that the dead will seek out others who enter the temple. Joseph Smith was a sorcerer and practiced crystal ball gazing or fortune telling and was convicted of this practice by the New York courts. Smith's practices of magic and necromancy led him annually during a witchcraft holy day to the Hill Camorra in New York, specifically heard from the dead. There is strong evidence that in 1824, Joseph Smith actually had to dig up the body of his dead brother Alvin and bring part of that body with him to the Hill Camorra in order to gain access to the gold plates on which were written the Book of Mormon. It was also known within his community that Joseph Smith used blood sacrifices in his magic rituals to find hidden treasure. C.R. Stafford writes, Joe Smith the prophet told my uncle William Stafford he wanted a fat black sheep. He said he wanted to cut its throat and make it walk in a circle three times around. After his death, Smith was found to be carrying a magic talisman on his person, sacred to Jupiter designed to bring him wealth, power, and success in seducing women. While Mormons call themselves Christians, they do not regard the prohibitions of God seriously or have respect for the Christian Bible, which they claim abounds in errors and mistranslation. This conclusion leads the Mormons to place Joseph Smith above God and beyond criticism. His biblically forbidden practices are devoutly and enthusiastically emulated by Temple Mormons. While the general public may not see similarities in the religions of Mormonism and Satanism, remember that that is exactly what the Mormon brethren wish to hide. While Mormons claim to be Christian, many of their basic theologies are identical to Satanism. For years, we at Saints Alive have warned of the Luciferian roots of Mormonism and the Satanic worship within its ranks. Now at last, the LDS Church has officially acknowledged that we were right. Recently, a secret internal report surfaced from Mormon Bishop Glenn Pace, a member of the presiding bishopric of the LDS Church. It alleged that widespread satanic ritual abuse across America, Mexico, and elsewhere was being perpetrated by both members and leaders of the Mormon Church, bishops, temple workers, and even tabernacle choir members. Acts of sexual or physical torture and murder were done in a religious or occult context and subjected children to molestation by parents and other adults. At least 45 of the scores of LDS victims Pace interviewed for his report claimed they were forced to observe or participate in human sacrifice. Obviously, there are some who would like to lay the blame on infiltrators or individual preferences. But the broader issue is that Joseph Smith was deeply involved in the occult. It is therefore quite natural to surmise that Smith's followers would be involved in the same practices that he advocated. Mormon parents don't realize the spiritual danger they are putting their children in by simply attending this temple themselves. The danger to a Mormon is, is that when you go and you stand at the veil and you say, power in the priesthood be upon me and upon my posterity throughout all generations of time and all eternity, you are putting the curse of Satan's priesthood upon yourself and upon your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. We are seeing in Utah the fruit of this in social statistics. We are seeing that homosexuality is running rampant among people in Utah. We are seeing child abuse. We are seeing teenage suicide. Homosexuality has increased 
by 50%, 100%, 200%, and it has just gone upward. Also adultery, the number one reason that the church excommunicates is for adultery, and its numbers are staggering and increasing every year. Another area of concern is the rising amount of child abuse within the LDS church. The kind of impression Mormons want to be associated with is the epitome of all that is wholesome. Yet the happy family facade in Mormon-filled Utah is disintegrating rapidly, according to recent national statistics. In a state monopolized by a religious group that advertises marital harmony, Utah's divorce rate is higher than the national average. 55,000 women are abused annually by their partners. Child abuse and neglect has increased 212% in the last decade, with over 10,000 new cases last year alone. Rape and sexual assault for adults has increased 93% during the same period. There has been a staggering 379% increase in child sexual abuse to children under 14. Much of the abuse is incestuous and sadly the perpetrators are given lenient sentences because of an oddity in Utah law which accommodates sexual abuse by a Mormon relative. In 1987, Bill Clawden, a lifelong Mormon, began investigations into allegations of immoral practices among the Mormon leaders, specifically President Gordon B. Hinckley. Gordon Hinckley was involved in heterosexual and homosexual love affairs at the home on Lakeline Drive as well as the apartment above the car lot on South Main. I was personally involved with the Apostle Gordon Hinckley sexually. We became financially involved in a house at 2213 Lakeline Drive. We bought the house for a party pad. <clears throat> and Gordon Hinckley came up there all the time. And I had to arrange women for him. I had to arrange booze for him. I had four or five bedrooms, three-story job, beautiful home. We used to go up there all the time. I took prostitutes up, on the, uh, up in Indian Hills, which is an exclusive neighborhood in Salt Lake. And this went on for several years. And basically, most of the girls they requested me to bring to them were black girls. And most of them were tall and kind of linky. Louie would bring up four or five girls at a time, bring them to the door. Mr. Hinckley, amongst other people, were there. But they'd drink and dance. And maybe the girls would dance for them, you know, in front of them. Uh, and then they'd gather up a man and go into the bedroom. Mr. Hinckley and, and all of them were sitting there, and I remember one night when I was there, he was sitting there, and he was really getting loose, you know, and he had his arm around this one girl, and, and pretty soon I seen everybody just taking off, going this way and that way to different rooms. These parties are something else, and these people that are supposed to be good LDS. They were supposed to be important people and supposed to be uh, good church-going people and things like that. Some of them were bishops and counselors and various things that, uh, that I actually seen going there or leaving there. There was a couple of young boys at a party one night when I was there. And I'd say they were around 15 or 16 that uh, I seen them talking with Hinckley and they went off to a bedroom together. Hinckley and the boys, the two boys. And he liked to have feminine looking boys. Youngsters, I'm talking about 15, 16 years old. Just little youngsters, babies. They live a double standard. Their, their leaders are saying one thing and living another lifestyle. They excommunicate bisexuals in the mainline LDS church, why are the leaders getting away with it? He had used me sexually, myself personally, and then excommunicated me on the homosexuality. We just believe that if Gordon B. Hinckley is professing that you should be morally clean so you can sit in judgment upon others, that he should be judged by the same standards he's trying to use. When you see it with your own eyes, you know what they really do, especially high officials like Mr. Hinckley. I said, I can't believe this. 
Had similar allegations been made against a Christian leader or rabbi, it would have received worldwide publicity. But in this case, an extraordinary media blackout stopped the hottest story of the 80s concerning one of the top Mormons in the world. Tonight I'm being excommunicated here at the Oak Hills First Ward for telling a story of truth about one of the high-ranking members of the LDS Church, uh, namely Gordon B. Hinckley. There is nothing within the doctrinal uh, procedures of the church that allows any one member the opportunity to bring an accusation against any of the presidency of the church. My good bishop here at the Oak Hills First Ward, uh, as I got to know him, uh, he's a good man. Uh, he knows the truthfulness of the story. He has talked to one of the witnesses personally. And unfortunately, working for the church and being a bishop in this ward, he is unable to stand up for me. As any image conscious corporation, the Mormon Church responds to public relations problems smoothly and quickly. It commands an efficient and polished communications team to market Mormonism to the world. Key Mormons have been placed in powerful positions that have had the ability to control virtually all media programming. The radio station that dared to air an interview with Charles Van Dam was subsequently bought out within days and the talk host who featured the story was fired. The Mormon controlled media conglomerate Bonneville International Corporation is one of the largest owners of radio and TV stations, bringing in more than a half a billion dollars in revenue each year. The power of the LDS church and media was confirmed during a 60 Minutes news expose on Mormonism. After labeling the story as sloppy journalism, the Mormons forced a rare apology from 60 Minutes and the dismissal of the producer of the segment. Mormons in political office have been able to pressure Hollywood not to produce films that portray Mormonism in a negative way. Recently, a $20 million miniseries based on the book The Mormon Murders was kept off the air because it would have revealed the conspiratorial power of the Mormon church in the Hoffman murder case. I'm especially concerned with the uh, amount of influence they have over the media. You know, the people who really uh, control our country are, are those in control of the media. The Mormon Church owns not only a number of radio and television stations, in not only in Salt Lake City, but in uh, Idaho, in Washington State, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, in Kansas City. And, and not only do they own a number of these radio stations and cable companies, but companies that they also own, in turn, own others of these. When the church wants to get uh, airtime in Brazil or somewhere else, they, all they need to do is to go and ask the government people, we would like to uh, present a half hour program on the family and, and, and on increasing patriotism, and right away they'll get airtime. Two years ago, Hungarian television came over and did a nice story on the Mormons, and over 400 million people learned about the Mormons. Church didn't have to pay for it, and the ironic thing is that these big television evangelistic ministries, they have to pay out millions of dollars. The Mormon church has it down to a science, and they are probably the best PR people of any religion that I know. The Mormon Empire's immense economic power not only aids Mormon control in the media, but in politics also, where they look to the day when they will have total command, world political takeover and the reinstatement of the free practice of polygamy and blood atonement are just some of the bizarre hopes of the Mormon's end times empire known as the Kingdom of God. The fanatical goal of world supremacy is openly denied but secretly plotted by the elite inner LDS leadership, the Brethren. The church has been fortunate to have a number of its people in prominent positions around the country in political authority. Senators, congressmen, people in the CIA and the FBI, and at times the church has called upon them to go and do a favor for the church, get the church out of a jam, or use their political clout in behalf of the church. The head of church security who recently died was a top FBI man under J. Edgar Hoover. They have retired CIA men working. They have uh, people from the Navy counterintelligence. And so the church has amassed an incredible amount of security personnel that gives it some of the best security of any religion on the face of the earth. Someone I talked with said, we can get anything we want on anyone we want at any time we want. Apostle Bruce R. McConkie said, through this church and kingdom, a framework has been built through which the full government of God will eventually operate. They believe that they must establish a worldwide Mormon kingdom on earth in order for Christ to return and rule on earth. 
Recently, a massive effort has been underwritten to mount an all-out recruiting drive with the deliberate intention of marketing Mormonism as a bastion of domestic strength and middle-class respectability. In addition to the 44,000 full-time missionaries in the field, Mormon advertising saturates the pages of many best-selling publications, including TV Guide and Reader's Digest. In response, hundreds of thousands of free Mormon videos and their holy scripture, the Book of Mormon, are requested annually. The Mormon Church shrewdly purchased airtime following one Billy Graham TV special and promoted the Mormon 800 number, hoping to capture undiscerning audience inquiries. They are spending tens of millions of dollars annually on ad campaigns appealing specifically to the Christian market. They are joining Christian organizations and targeting Bible studies, Christian home school groups, and churches, particularly focusing in on local pastors with friendship programs. Christians must realize that the Mormon hope of appearing Christian is not reflected in their teachings. Mormons still believe that all Christian pastors are part of the great horror of all the earth. They still have the hope of becoming gods and goddesses. The Mormon Jesus is still the brother of Lucifer. They still teach that our holy God was once a man and has a body that Jesus was begotten through a sexual relationship between the Father and Mary, that the Garden of Eden was in Missouri, that the Bible is missing many plain and precious parts, that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth, that plural marriage is a holy principle. They still follow the teachings of a false prophet. They still usurp the holy priesthood of Christ. They still baptize for the dead. They still wear occult underwear with Masonic markings, they still believe they must offer up secret handshakes and secret names to enter into God's presence. They still teach that all the Christian creeds are an abomination in God's sight and more. God's word is still reliable and it doesn't vacillate and Mormonism is still in direct violation of the word of God. One cannot revise Mormonism enough, one has to repent of it. The ones that murdered my husband and my family I forgive them entirely. I love them. They're my own family. And they truly, sincerely feel like they're doing what's right. And I'm praying that somehow through all of this that I get the opportunity to witness to them and to show them uh, how the Lord has worked in my life. And uh, because, but for the grace of God, I could still be involved in that too. My faith in God is something that is unshakable and uh, through all this tragedy that's one thing I have gained is an abiding love for the truth. <laughs>